Right, uh, welcome back everyone. Let's continue with our program and thank you for staying so long and uh, uh, your patience and um, your ears and your brains are going to be needed now. <laughs> um, Roger's been taking us through the Bible and really trying to unlock how the Bible fits together as a whole. Um, we call it the story of the Bible or theologians will call it biblical theology. Um, it's trying to understand how this part of the Bible fits with this part of the Bible. And many Christians, uh, well, we, we've got the whole Bible, but sometimes a little bit difficult for us to understand how the whole thing fits together. And Roger's been looking at under the headings of God, uh, Abraham, David, Jesus, and Paul. And I'm assuming we're going to finish with Paul. Did we touch on Jesus yesterday? I've already, we did so much, so, okay, good. So I need your brains. And a, and a book and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a pen, a notebook and a pen helps as well. Um, why don't we stand together and sing uh, to God's glory and then we'll kick off our program. Uh, if you've got your booklets, uh, page 11, In Christ Alone. Amen. Thank you, Roger. Well, hello, everybody. It's fantastic to see so many of you here. Uh, it really is. Um, we've also got some people uh, here who were not here yesterday. And so welcome to you. And, um, 
and for the sake of our, our new people who have come today, and also to remind us about what we looked at yesterday under this topic of Christ and the Covenant, I'm going to do a, a very quick summary of what we did yesterday, just to bring us up to speed. Then we're going to look at Paul, who is Paul, very briefly, and then we're going to look at this, the, the, the unique message that Paul had for the church and why Paul on his own is so important. So, we've been looking um, at the covenants from the perspective of five persons. God, Abraham, David, the Lord Jesus, and the Apostle Paul. Now concerning God, we saw that he is the creator. He created all things seen and unseen. He did it simply by speaking, not by exerting any effort, but by simply saying, let there be light, and so on. And so we learn from that, that he is a being of unlimited power. His power is so great that we cannot begin to imagine it. And of course, that's why he's God. Then we saw that this creator God of unlimited power, enormous awesome power, is the king. Not just a king, but the king. And we saw in Genesis how he creates things by his words, how he sets things, sets things out. He creates a garden for man, Adam, and his wife, Eve. He makes rules, and when they break the rules, he comes in and he judges them. To use my son, who's 18 years old, he's got a slang term. says, so acts like a boss. Talking like a boss. Those of you who are gamers will know exactly what that means. Uh, you know, the big guy. He's the big guy. So he's a king, and one of the most important things we saw about him is that since he created all things by his um, great power, he, he has property rights over it. It is his. He made it. That's why it's his. And so he has the right to do as he pleases with the world because it is his. A theme that we looked at. Then, swiftly moving on to Abraham. After the flood, when God had destroyed the human race because of violence and sexual immorality, starts again with Noah, but things go badly wrong again because the Tower of Babel you know, tells us all about that. God spoke to Abraham just out of the blue. And he, and he comes to Abraham and he makes him promises. Now these promises we discovered are the gospel. They're actually called the gospel in the New Testament. And what are these promises? Abraham, get up. I'm going to take you to a land that I will give you. That's a gospel promise. I'm going to give you more sons than you can count. I'm going to curse your enemies. I'm going to bless you. And in you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And then we saw how God confirmed that promise of a land by making a covenant. Remember the covenant in blood with the animals that were cut in two. Because in response to Abraham's question, how can I know that you will give me this land? And then we saw when uh, God tested him by asking him to, uh, commanding him to sacrifice the son that he had promised. When, he was, when the boy was 13 years old, Abraham immediately believed, immediately obeyed, because he, re he, re he uh, reasoned to himself that God would resurrect him because this is the child through whom the blessing must come. So he immediately obeys. And so God says, because you have obeyed me, by myself I swear. He makes an oath. Surely, blessing I will bless you. Okay. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. Also, this covenant that God made with Abraham is the ruling covenant. It is the master covenant that governs all of the other covenants of the Bible. Remember we looked at Paul in Galatians, he says, look, even in the case of a man's covenant, once the covenant is established, you can't add anything to it, you can't take away anything from it. And it's just like that with this covenant. So when Moses comes and he makes another covenant with Israel, it doesn't add to Abraham's covenant, it doesn't subtract from Abraham's covenant. It can't, because Abraham's came first. And the same thing applies to the covenant that Jesus makes, the eternal covenant in his blood. Praise the Lord. It's a confirming covenant. We saw that, that um, when um, the Holy Spirit filled Mary, she says, God has remembered the covenant that he swore to our father Abraham. When John the Baptist's 
father, Zacharias, receives back the power of his speech and he's filled with the Holy Spirit, he says exactly the same thing. God has remembered the covenant that he swore to our father Abraham. The reason Jesus is born, the reason that he's come, the reason that John the Baptist was there, who is Elijah. The reason they come is to perform the covenant. That's the actual words that Zechariah used. To perform the covenant, which is to say to fulfill it. And in ordinary English, he's come to make it happen. That's what the word fulfill means. What has Jesus come to fulfill? All of the promises that God made to Abraham. And we looked at, we looked at the, very briefly at the fact that it was all of the promises. The children, the land, the blessing, the cursing of enemies, the lot. Then we looked at King David because what God had promised to Abraham is a kingdom. God is a king. He's got a people that he chose for himself, Abraham and his descendants. Every king must have a land. God has got the land that he's chosen for himself. It's the land of Canaan. So you've got God the king with his people and he's blessing them in the land. So we know about how they had to go down into Egypt, Abraham's descendants, how they had to come back out of Egypt, how they had to take possession of the land, how they were there under the judges, which were like prime ministers really because God is the king. Okay? And after about 500 years they say, no, 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 we want a king like the heathen. So God gives them a king, which was King Saul, the first Christ. Because remember, the word Christ means anointed one. And the way that you get made a king is by being anointed. Now, I'm a subject of Her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth II. And she was made a queen in exactly the same way. The Archbishop of Canterbury comes and pours oil upon her head in order to make her queen. And only then is she given the crown. Exactly the same, and of course it's taken from the Bible. So now God decides, yes, God is the high king, but I'm going to have an under king. That's King David. We looked at King David. We looked at the promise, the covenant, another promise covenant, by the way, promise covenant that God makes to King David. He says, look, you wanted to build me a house. I didn't ask you to. Your son will build it for me. I'm, I'm delighted about that, but I'm going to establish your house, and here's what I'm going to do. Your house will be the ruling house, the royal house over Israel forever. And when your son comes, eventually the son comes, the Messiah, and the, the prophets all spoke about this as well. We looked at that. His kingdom will endure forever. Do you remember that? Okay. So that's God. We've looked at Abraham, the, the master covenant, the, great, the promises. David is going to be the king over God's people in God's kingdom. And remember, in the Bible, whenever it talks about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, it's talking about Israel. It never says the kingdom of God in heaven. It says the kingdom of heaven, which is another way of talking about God. Then we looked at, in all of these things, we constantly went to the Lord Jesus to see how he fulfilled them. We saw how Jesus has come to confirm and to fulfill the promises that God made to Abraham. We've looked at that. But we also saw that when the angel Gabriel comes to Mary to tell her, look, you know, you're going to be the mum of the king of Israel. He, and we read these words every Christmas, don't we? He will be great. He will sit upon the throne of his father David. He will rule over the house of Jacob and his kingdom will endure forever. Not just for a thousand years. Forever. Which is exactly what God said to David. It's exactly what the prophet said. After the exile that is coming because you Israelites don't know how to serve God because your hearts are far away from him. You're all idolaters. After the great punishment that is coming, at some point in the future, I will bring Israel back. And remember we looked at that passage in Isaiah, in Isaiah 37? Them bones, them bones, them dry bones. Remember that song? Isaiah chapter? Ezekiel. Ezekiel. Thank you. I make that mistake all the time. I think I'm saying Ezekiel, but I'm actually saying another word. So now that you know that about me, when it happens again, you know, you say, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm old, you know. 
Although I have to admit, I've been doing it my whole life. <laughs> Jean, who is, is with us there, knows this from, from many years ago. So, Jesus has come to establish the kingdom that God promised to Abraham. He's the son of David. He fulfills those requirements. Now remember, just one little point about this. Why it's important that Jesus is the son of Abraham and the son of David. It's not just to tick a box. Dylan, am I speaking too fast? People, am I speaking too fast? Is it okay? I'm going fast because, you know, we've been here for a long time. And, you know, it's, it's the afternoon. I don't want you guys to fall asleep on me. Okay. I also don't want you to get cross with me because I'm talking for too long. I know what it's like to sit in, in, the, in, in, the, in the ministry. To sit under somebody's ministry like who doesn't know when to stop talking. I don't want to be that guy. Okay, so that's why I'm checking with you. Are you we're all awake. Okay. So we look constantly how Jesus fulfills the promises to Abraham. The promise that God made to David, Abraham's son. But the important thing about this is not just that we can tick a checklist. Oh, yes, he's the son of Abraham. Oh, he's the son of David. No, there's a reason for it. The reason is that he is the seed that God promised to Abraham in Genesis 22 after Abraham had, 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 was willing to sacrifice his son. When God swore on oath to him, he said, in your seed, all the nations of the earth, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Paul tells us in Galatians, Jesus is that seed. So he's not just the son of Abraham. The Jews are all sons of Abraham. So what? Why is Jesus the son of Abraham? He's the seed who brings blessings. And of course we know how he does that. It's by dying for our sins, but also by being raised up for our um, justification. Okay, so we looked, and so that's the work of Jesus. Now I want to make a point about the resurrection of Jesus before I move on to the Apostle Paul. Jesus was raised up and we need, on the third day, and we need to understand what that means. He says, it's all very well to know that Jesus was raised in the body on the third day, and that's fantastically important. But the, the big question is, yes, 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 he was raised from the dead. What does it mean? Now the question is not, what does it mean for me, or what does it mean for you? The, re the first question is, what does this mean for the Lord Jesus? That's the question, the main question that the apostles want to answer. And what it means for the Lord Jesus is that God, by raising him from the dead, has appointed him to the throne of his father, David. That's the point. How do you know that Jesus is the Messiah? Remember, Messiah means Christ. Christ means the King of Israel. How do you know that he's the King of Israel? Well, God has given us the evidence of that by raising him from the dead. Forty days later, Jesus ascended into heaven and he sat down at the right hand of the Father. Now, what was the name of the chair that Jesus sat on? You've got to sit on a chair. What's another word for a chair? A throne. Whose throne was it? We looked at this yesterday. Somebody gave me the right answer. Can you say it out loud? David! How do we know that? Well, you see, I'm a very clever theologian. And I've deeply delved into the Bible. No, that's not the answer. It's never the answer. The Bible tells us in black and white, in so many words. Remember Acts chapter 2? Um... Gosh, I'm preaching the whole sermon again. I have to be careful. All my time is flying, flying away from me here. Acts chapter 2. is uh, When Peter is explaining the meaning of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, he says, look, David prophesied, knowing that God had spoken, had sworn to him on earth, that one of his descendants would sit upon his throne. Not God's throne. David's throne. Prophesied concerning the Christ. It's in Acts chapter 2. Okay. What this means is that bearing in mind that God had made this promise, God has now raised up this Jesus whom you killed and made him Lord and Christ. Well, if he's not sitting on David's throne, he's not the Christ. I'm going to say that again. 
if he's not sitting on David's throne, he's not the king. Christ king. It's the same thing. So, so Peter is saying, you see here, the promise that God made to David has been fulfilled by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And he's sitting on David's throne. Now listen, you need to, to get the point of what this means for the Jews who are listening. Uh, Peter is saying to them, you killed him. And then he quotes Psalm 110 verse 1. This is amazing. The Lord God said to my Lord, the Messiah, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. What does that mean? You killed Jesus, now he's coming for you. Oh, what must we do? What must we do? Repent and be baptized, every one of you Jews, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay. The point is, the whole point of the resurrection is that Jesus has been exalted, raised from the dead, to begin the rule over God's kingdom. Jesus has entered the kingdom of God by resurrection, the way that Ezekiel said, the way that, that's the way you enter the kingdom, finally. We have to wait for that. Okay, so that's Jesus. I need, there's so much more to say, of course, but I need to move on to the Apostle Paul. Now that was just a quick taste and a summary of what we looked at yesterday. It's fantastic to have our minds renewed and to remember uh, uh, where we're going with all of this. And now we need to ask ourselves the question, okay, so what is Paul all about? Because, you know, Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Now, there may be some of, the, of our brothers and sisters here who don't really know who Paul is. So for the sake of those who do, please bear with me for a minute. Just to remind ourselves also, who is the Apostle Paul? Well... The Apostle Paul was a Jew, he was of the tribe of Benjamin, he was a Jew of Jews, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, he was one of the up-and-coming men, he was also a murderer of Christians and a denier of Christ. And he says there, by the way, that's why I'm the least of all the, all the saints, is because I murdered Christians. I raised my hand against God's people. He did it sincerely truly believing that he was serving the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He believed it. He thought, these people are preaching a false gospel, and the, and the law of Moses says they must die. He was there when Stephen was murdered. You can read about that in Acts chapter 7. You all know about that, don't you? He was there holding the cloaks of the men who stoned him to death. Then, he gets authority somehow from the Jewish rulers to go and arrest the Jews in Damascus. That's not even in the land of Israel. I'm not sure how that worked out, but that was the case. So he used to go around arresting the Christians and then imprisoning them and then killing them whenever he could because he thought that this was pleasing to God. And on the way there, the Lord Jesus Christ meets him face to face. Now, we all think of Paul's conversion of the road to Damascus as, you know, that's when he got born again. But that's really to miss the point. On the road to Damascus, Paul saw the risen Lord with his own eyes. It's hard to deny that Jesus has been raised from the dead when he's standing in front of you. In glory. He's not just converted, he's commissioned. In other words, he gets given a job. That's what the word commissioning means. So he's converted and he's given a job. And the gospel is to take the message of Christ's resurrection and what it means to the Jews, to the kings, and to the Gentiles. Now this is a new thing. And this, thing, this is something we need to understand very clearly. Because the church has been Gentile for so long that we're forgetting what a big deal it is that the church is in fact Gentile. Now, would you agree with me that everything that I've been saying up to now is all about Israel and about the Jews? Would you agree with me? God chose Abraham and his seed, the Jews. Did he choose the Gentiles? No. Who are the enemies of the Jews? The Gentiles. So what does God do to Israel's enemies? Whoever curses you, I will curse. So the Gentiles are under a curse. But God had said, 
Also in the gospel that he preached to Abraham, in you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. That's in chapter 12. And in chapter 22, in your seed, he gets, gives us more detail. All the families of the earth will be blessed. Now the word Gentile is just a, an Italian word for, for people, for families. Gentile means people or families. Because if you think about it, a nation is a big family, isn't it? They usually have a common ancestor. That's what a nation is, usually. So what has all of this got to do with the Gentiles? Now, Paul's special message was to go out to the non-Jews for the first time, almost the first time in their history, with one or two exceptions, and to preach to them that Christ had be, has been raised from the dead, but also to explain to them that Christ had died for the Jews in order to take away the curse of the law, that's Moses, so that the blessing of Abraham could come upon the Gentiles. Who can tell me where that verse is found? Galatians chapter 3. Christ has taken upon himself the curse of the law for us, meaning the Jews. Why? So that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles. Now, that's, the, that's what we're going to look at now. Right now. That's our final talk. Paul, where we bring it all together. And we're in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 11. And here is the thing that God told Paul to go and teach to the Gentiles that he didn't say to Peter or to the other twelve. Remember, Paul was known as the apostle to the Gentiles. Peter was the apostle to the Jews. Now, they both preached to Jews and Gentiles, but Paul's main mission was to the Gentiles. Now, that means people who are not Jewish. And Paul's job is to explain what Abraham and David and the Lord Jesus, the King of Israel, what they've got to do with the Gentiles and what is the interest that God that that God and the Lord Jesus have in the Gentiles. Now, I'm, I'm going to, to read from verse 11. <clears throat> Dylan, what time did I start? You know, you know that you've all heard the story about, you know, the minister always takes out his watch and he puts it on the table there. And that's supposed to be so that he can keep watch of the time. And a, and a man is in the congregation with his son, and his son leans over to his father and he says, Daddy, what does it mean when the minister puts his watch on the pulpit? And the, son, the father replies to the son, it means nothing. <laughs> now, I'm watching, my, I'm watching, okay. So I've spent 20 minutes. Okay. Right, now he's talking to the Gentiles. Uh, this church is in Ephesus, it's in modern day Turkey, it's nowhere near the promised land, it's full of Greeks and people of every tribe and tongue, and he's writing to the church there and he's addressing them as Gentiles. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 11, therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, now the Jews were very insulting about the Gentiles. Because they all had to be circumcised, you know that, hey? And so the Gentiles weren't circumcised, so they referred to the, to the Gentiles as the uncircumcised. There's more to talk to say about that, but now's not the time. But it's a big insult. You who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, meaning the Jews, made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. Abraham, David, the Lord Jesus, his covenant. Having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Okay. I want you to take, pay special attention to verse 12. If you don't have a Bible, no problem. I'm going to read it to you again. 
that at that time, this is before they came to faith in Christ, at that time, you Gentiles, you the un that the Jews like to call the uncircumcised, the insult, the uncircumcised, that was just one of the insults. They also called them dogs. Jesus even called the Gentiles little dogs. <laughs> Jesus, the Lord Jesus. It's not lawful to give the children's bread to the little dogs. That at that time you were without Christ. That means outside of Christ. Without. Not, not having Christ, although of course it means that. You were outside of him. He's the king of Israel. You're outside of Israel. You're not part of, the, of, of this king's realm. You're not a member of his people. You were, uh, were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Different words in the Bible for the commonwealth of Israel. The church. Church is an Old Testament word. It, 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 it's found in the Old Testament. It means the called out ones. Which is another way to say the chosen people. Yes? So the commonwealth of Israel is called by many names in the Bible. It's the church, the called out ones, the ecclesia. It's the kingdom of God. It's the kingdom of heaven. But it's the commonwealth of Israel. Commonwealth is a normal word for a, for a people, a country. I'm a citizen of the Commonwealth of England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. At that time, you were aliens. Aliens. In England, you can't use that word aliens because they think of green men with antenna on their heads. Foreigners. Foreigners from the Commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. What are the covenants of promise? The promises that God made to Abraham. The promise that God made to David and the promise that God's promises that God made to Israel through the Lord Jesus because you know Jesus came for the lost sheep of Israel you know that eh? do you remember he said that I was not sent except to the lost sheep of Israel for who did Jesus die he died for the Jews that's what Paul says he said Jesus died upon the cross taking upon himself the curse of the law for us meaning the Jews, so that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles. Having no hope, that means no possibility of resurrection. Every time in the Bible it talks about hope, it means resurrection. It doesn't mean, like we use the word hope, yeah, I hope it will be okay. In other words, you know, that would be really nice, but I'm not sure it's going to happen. No, no. This is a sure and a certain hope. And the reason it's called a hope is because you haven't got it now. It's still in the future. But it's not a maybe hope. It's a sure and a certain hope. And remember we looked at Ezekiel, how God said he was going to save Israel by raising them from the dead. Do you remember that? Them bones, them bones, them dry bones. Hear the word of the Lord. So they didn't have that hope. In the ancient world, the, the Greeks and the Romans all thought when you died, that was it. That was it. Who saw Gladiator? The movie Gladiator. Do you remember the big bad Gladiator? He's got a mask and he's got a tear there. That summarized the worldview of, of the Romans and the Greeks and of the pagans. You see, well, life was very sad and then you died. So the worldview of the Gentiles is life is very sad, life is very hard and then you die. I saw a fantastic sign in Cork Bay this morning. It said, um, eat well, eat healthily, stay fit, and die anyway. <laughs> That's what it means to be without hope. But now that you've come to believe in Christ, you have hope. And without God in the world, how can you have God in the world when you're an idolater? And by God... He doesn't just mean that power up in the sky that's, that some people believe in. He means God, the creator of heaven and earth. Almighty God, the king of God's kingdom, who chose Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and made a kingdom and promised that this kingdom would eventually be revealed at the resurrection. That's what he means by God. He's not talking about what everybody else thinks God means. 
It's obviously the God of Abraham. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Now you need to understand to what have the Gentiles been brought near. Now we all think we know the answer to that. Oh, we've been brought to Jesus. Yes, but something else has to happen first. Yes, we are brought near to Christ. But there are other people that we have to be brought near to first. And that's how, what he explains in the next passage. For he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh, by the cross, the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, and thus making peace. Okay, let me, let me just explain what that means. He has made both one. Who is the both? The Jew and the Gentile. So he's made the Jew and the Gentile one. How did he do that? By breaking down the middle wall of separation. Oh, there was a wall of separation keeping the Gentiles out of the commonwealth of Israel. Yes. What is it? Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, that's the law of Moses. So one of the things, the first thing, the first benefit to us of the cross is that the middle wall keeping the Gentiles out of the commonwealth of Israel, which is the law of Moses, was destroyed. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's very simple. God gave the Jews lots of food laws, and it wasn't so that they could be more healthy than the Gentiles. Because they didn't have fridges suddenly when Jesus was raised from, the, raised from the dead. And the food laws changed after Jesus was raised from the dead. Now does the Bible say, well, they discovered fridges. And so that now we could eat pork without fear of being contaminated. And we can now eat prawns and calamari and all that lovely stuff that is forbidden by the law of Moses. Because, you know, now we're more hygienic than we were before. No, obviously not. You can't be friends with somebody if you can't eat with them. We had lovely food all together. <laughs> Go and try and have a meal with a Muslim. You can't eat with them. In those days, before Jesus rose from the dead, try and go and have a meal with a Jew. First of all, they, you couldn't get into their house. You weren't allowed in. That's the law of Moses. Also, they couldn't come to your house. Remember what Peter says when God says to him, go to the, to the home of, of the centurion, Cornelius. Do you remember that? But Lord, I've never been into the house of a Gentile. And God says to him, don't you call unclean what I have made clean. They've been made clean. So the law of separation was the law of Moses and the reason was it, well, there were two reasons for, the, for this wall of laws. We're in South Africa. We all know what, what the walls of separation are, don't we? Because of apartheid. So there was a divine apartheid commanded that God commanded for his people to keep the Gentiles out. It was so that the Gentiles couldn't come in with their idols and convert the Israelites to idolatry. Because what did, the, what did the Israelites love more than money? Idols. It was so that when Christ appeared, there would actually be godly Jews on the face of the earth who hadn't all gone running after idols. There was another reason. It was to keep the Jews in. <laughs> which is the main reason, one of the big reasons. So when Paul says in Galatians, the law was given to lead us to Christ, what that means is the, the law of Moses was given to bring the Jews as a people, historically up to the time of Christ, so that when Christ appeared, there would be a people of God. So it's to keep the Gentiles out, it's also to keep the Jews in. Do you remember the Berlin Wall? It was to keep people inside the communist paradise. So what has happened now is that that wall has been broken down because God wants the Gentiles in the kingdom now. 
Not that he had a sudden change of mind, it's just that the time has come for it. Because remember that this inclusion of the Gentiles, the nations, the peoples of the earth, the families of the earth, was promised to Abraham. In you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And then in Genesis chapter 22, in your seed, meaning Jesus, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So it was always God's intention, but just not yet. So the first benefit of the cross is the law of Moses is abolished so that the Gentiles can come in. Come into what? The common wealth of Israel. And the new man there is a picture way of talking. You've got a Jew, you've got a Gentile, but from now on, they're not Jews and Gentiles anymore because God is taking the two and he's making them into one new man, which is a Christian. So now you're not a Jew, but you're also not a Gentile. If you who are not, you who are not descended from Abraham have come to faith in the God of Abraham, you're not a Gentile anymore. But it also means a Jew isn't a Jew anymore. So what are we? Well, we're Israelites. Do you remember that from the time of Abraham up to the time of Moses, there was no law? So the law of Moses isn't the thing that makes a Jew into a Jew. It's believing the promises that God made to Abraham. So in a way, it's a return to that time. So he has created in himself one new man from the two and thus in this way making peace. Who is the peace between here? Between the Jew and the Gentile. The Jews hated the Gentiles, the Gentiles hated the Jews. Now there's a new man because there's peace between them because we both have the same king and we've both been forgiven, received the same forgiveness for our sins because of his blood. How is a Jew made right with God? Through the cross of Jesus. How is a Gentile made right with God? Through the cross, through the blood of Jesus. So now there's no reason for us to hate each other. And when I say us, I'm talking about Jews and Gentiles. But you need to understand another thing now. What Paul is saying here to Gentiles, meaning heathens, the Dutch Bible translates this word much better than the English Bible. It calls them Haydener. When you become a Christian, you're actually changing your nationality. I'm going to say that again. What Paul is explaining here is that the Gentiles, by becoming into the commonwealth of Israel, had changed their nationality. They've now become co-heirs and fellow citizens with the Jews. So how many Israelites are sitting here today? All the Israelites here, please put up your hand. Okay, so I see that, um, that God sent me here to, to, to preach to you for a reason. It's because you don't know that you're Israelites. You're not Gentiles. The Muslims are Gentiles. The Hindus are Gentiles. The atheists are Gentiles. I'm not a Gentile, I'm an Israelite. And my family have been Israelites for 1500 years. There was a Gentile in my ancestry and he worshipped Thor and Odin. But when the gospel came to them and to him, and he was baptized into the name of Jesus for the remission of his sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit, he stopped being a Gentile and he became an Israelite. And his children, after him, were born into the covenant. So, my family have been Israelites since, because I'm English, okay, from about six, seven hundred after Christ, because that's when the gospel came to the English. Every single one of you believes in the Lord Jesus Christ and has been received baptism is an Israelite. And that's what Paul wants you to understand. Because how can you receive the blessing of Abraham if you're not an Israelite? 
I'm going to say that again. How can you receive the blessing of Abraham if you're not an Israelite? Who is the blessing for? For Abraham and for his children. So you must become a child of Abraham. Otherwise you can't have the blessing. Remember what Paul says? Jesus took upon himself the curse of the law for us, the Jews, so that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles. So all the Israelites in this room, put up your hand. Ach, nie, man. Muni so wie sie. This is exactly what Paul is explaining to the Ephesians. And this is the thing that Paul is explaining. The special message that he had. This is exactly this point. And after Christ by the cross has made, has made peace between the Jew and the Gentile to make them into a new man, then he reconciles the new man who is Israel, the new Israel, which is actually the old Israel, then he reconciles this new man to God. Because look what it says in verse 16. And, which means also, okay, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross. I'm going to say it again. And that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross and thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. So the cross in the first place creates a new people. Christians. A new people in which both Jew and Gentile are, are heirs and citizens of the commonwealth of Israel. So the Jews stop being Jews because they stop circumcision, they stop, doing, they stop following all those, lewd, those food laws. So they're still Israelites, but they're not Jews, if you know what I mean. They're not observing those specially Jewish things. They're Israelites, but now the Gentiles are also Israelites. So the first reconciliation is between the Jew and the Gentile. That's what the text says. The second thing that the cross achieves is now this new man, which is this, is this new Israel. Now, God is ready to have peace with Israel. Because God was at war with Israel. Because of their idolatry. But this first step had to happen first. That's why it's called a first step, obviously. And then, he reconciles himself to the covenant people. Can you see here, we're operating in covenant categories. Paul, Paul is not talking about individuals, he's talking about groups of people. He's talking about the covenants of promise. He's saying, listen, you need to start thinking in terms of these covenants. You need to understand who you are. You Gentiles need to understand the mercy and the grace that has been extended to you. That you're included with Abraham's children, the believing ones. In all of these blessings, was that the power outage that we were warned about? It's back up. Okay. Okay, verse 17. He came and preached peace to you who were afar off. We all know who that is. Who were the people who were afar off? The Gentiles. And to those who were near. Near to whom? God. That's the Jews. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now he's going to repeat himself again. And I love this about Paul. Because he likes to say the same thing over and over. Because he knows that we're a bit thick. I love that word mampara. I haven't heard that word for 20 years. Because I've been in England. Paul knows that spiritually speaking. That we're all a bit dumb. So he has to say it again. Praise God that he says it again you know. Because then nobody can argue with this stuff. Because he says it over and over. Now therefore, verse 19. Chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners. But fellow citizens with the saints. By the way, that's an Old Testament word for Jews. Fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. What is the household of God in the Bible? 
It's the house of Abraham. It's the children of Abraham. They are the household of God. Israel. It's another word of, another way, just another way, normal way in the Bible of saying Israel. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. So to whom were the apostles and the prophets sent? To the Gentiles? To the Jews. Jesus Christ, Jesus the king of the Jews, remember Christ means king. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone of this new building, this new building, in whom the whole building, and he's using an image here. Can you see that? Picture language. What are the stones? Jews and Gentiles. <laughs> Jesus is the chief cornerstone that holds them together. You all know what a cornerstone is. You know that archway. When you make an archway, you have to, you have to put up a, a scaffolding of wood or of metal to stop the stones from falling in. But then you've got a big triangular, a, a, a big piece of st a stone that goes in the middle that is the capstone or the, the corners, the chief stone. And when you put that stone in, you can take the scaffolding in and the way that the stones all fall together, it's as if they've been welded together. But what keeps it from falling in and what makes it into one thing? It's the cornerstone the, or the capstone is another way to say the same thing, a capstone. Himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also, you also here doesn't mean you individually. You here is plural. It's yalla, not yay. We've lost that in English. We say you for one and for, t and for many. This is in whom yalla, not yay. Yalla, haydana. Israelita. Yella was Haydena, but now it's Yella Israelita. Yella also work are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Paul he still wants to talk more about this because he's so excited. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, for Yella Haydena. If indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, in other words, the stuff he's just, we've been looking at, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So that's why we've got Paul here. It's so that Christians who don't know that the Israelites can wake up to their privileges and you begin to understand where your citizenship is. You can understand what you're a citizen of. And you begin to understand what it is that God is giving you as an inheritance. And when you understand all of that stuff, then you have to praise him for his praise and his glory. For his honor and his glory. Which in other ages, this mystery was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. So what Paul is saying there, this stuff was all in the Old Testament, but it was hidden. It was in dark sayings or in short little sentences with no explanation, like, in you all the nations will be blessed, or in your seed all the nations will be blessed. So what Paul is saying is, now, at this time, since Christ has been raised from the dead, God has explained it to the apostles and the prophets completely so that the Gentiles can understand the blessing that they have received. I'm going to say it again. Christ took upon himself the, Christ, the curse of the law for the Jews so that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles. And so now he's going to repeat himself a third time. Well, he's, he's going to say it a third time. He's repeating himself twice. So now he's going to say it again in verse 6. So what's this great mystery that has now been revealed in a way that it was never revealed before? Well, he's going to say it again. Want ons is man paras. Ons moet mooi verstaan. Ons moet oor en oor die selle dinge hoor. 
that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise, that's the Abrahamic promise, obviously, in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. Okay, that brings me to the end of Paul. If Paul wasn't there, we would have no interest in the scriptures. We're not the children of Abraham according to the flesh. All of the promises originally were for the children of Abraham, the actual children from his body. The election was to Abraham and to his physical descendants. There was a divine apartheid that God commanded to be practiced between God's people and the Haydana. If Paul, if God hadn't sent Paul, well, we would still be worshipping Thor and Odin, me, my people from the north. And the others would be worshipping Diana of the Ephesians and... <laughs> Anything that we like to call God that isn't God. But Paul helps us to, explain, uh, helps us to understand how non-Jews get blessed. God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, of indescribable power, the mighty king, having proper property rights over his whole property, has chosen Abraham out of, and his seed out of all the nations of the earth to be a special people. He gave him a kingdom, a land, a people. He said this will come to pass in the fullness of time, when I'm ready. And when I'm ready, one of your descendants will bring blessing not just to the, to the children of Abraham, but also to the other families of the earth as well. Okay. There's got to be a king. Now, God is already the king, but he must have an under king who is a human. Because God always works through a human. That's why Jesus had to be human, by the way. Okay. This, this under king is King David and his descendants. So, the king of Israel, the Messiah, when he comes, must be a son of David. Not just a son of Abraham, a son of David. That's the meaning of that second promise covenant. Then we have Jesus who comes to do a fulfilling covenant or to use the word um, that Zechariah used, a performing covenant. He has come to perform the promises, to make them happen. He takes away the sins of Israel. But then it turns out that it's not just the Israelites who have had their sins taken away, but also the other nations of the earth. Because God sends Paul to our heathen ancestors to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to them so that they can share with the Jews in the blessing. The way that you come into this kingdom is by being baptized. Every one of you who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ who has not been baptized, don't delay. Go back and be baptized as soon as you possibly can. Don't delay. But it's not just you. It's you and your children. Let me put a different emphasis. It's you and your children. So that when your children are born, they are not born as heathens. They are born into the covenant. And so we who have been Christians for generations, we stopped being Gentiles long time ago. We are Israelites, together with the believing Jews. <coughs> One last thing remains to be said. This Jesus is sitting on, on, on the throne of David, waging war against his enemies. The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right, hand, my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. This war will come to an end when Jesus Christ returns in glory to the earth. Remember, this king of Israel has, has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. And he is the man whom God has appointed to judge every man in the body according to the deeds that he has done. 
So this king, and remember, in the Bible, the work of judgment always belongs to the king. This king will return to judge every human being who has ever lived. Everybody who has ever lived will be raised from the ground. And they will be given an opportunity to stand before the king of kings, the lord of lords, the judge of all the earth, to give an account of their lives. Those who have believed in him and have trusted in him and have repented of their sins will enter into the kingdom that God promised to Abraham and to David and to Jesus. And we will live in the land, the earth, the land, forever. Because it's an everlasting kingdom. Not for a thousand years. That's not an everlasting kingdom. That's a short-lasting kingdom. An everlasting kingdom. And it's everlasting because we can't die anymore. Jesus, another thing about Jesus' resurrection, he can't die. That's the point. Another point of the resurrection. And Jesus is going to give us that same gift. We won't die. We're not going to be raised as ghosts. For a, a ghost does not have flesh and bone, as you see I have, is what he said to Thomas. Do you remember? See, I'm not a ghost. Come and touch me. Touch my hand, my sides. Many of us think that being a Christian means you get to be a ghost in the sky. I can't see that anywhere in the Bible, brothers and sisters. I've been reading the Bible since 1983. I still haven't found that passage. Your future is to be a ghost. Ooh, um, no, thank you. I corner. Can I please have the same thing that you did for Jesus? <sighs> Fantastic. The bad news. All of those who have not believed in this king, who are outside of the covenant, who are still without Christ, outside of the common, commonwealth of Israel, apart from the, the uh, covenants of promise, and without God and without hope in the world, will also be raised from the body, and then they will be cast into a great fire of destruction. And so God will fulfill the promise that he swore to Abraham, whoever curses you I will curse, so there will be no enemies left. You see, every single promise that God made to Abraham must be understood literally. And that's the message we need to take to people. This king, this great king, is the judge of the earth. Every single time they, that in Acts, when they preach to the unbelieving Jews, they end with this message. When they go to Athens to preach to the heathen, they also end with this message about the bodily resurrection. That Christ is the judge who comes to judge the living and the dead, as we say in the creed. And you know, I've only recently, in the past few years, begun to understand that I was preaching an incomplete gospel without preaching that last bit. But the reason that Jesus is this judge is because he's the son of Abraham, the inheritor of the promises. It's because he's the son of David. It's because by his death and resurrection that he has performed the mercy. But there's one mercy remaining, which is to raise us and to give us the same thing that he has received from his father, which is the immortality of our bodies. Okay? That's why this important one, this one that God loves more than anybody else, God's beloved son. When you hear the words only begotten, we've got pastors here at BI and from other things. They will tell you that those words only begotten mean beloved. He is the one whom God has appointed to save or to destroy. How do you take hold of these promises? You. How did our fathers take hold of these promises? By faith. By faith. Believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. For there is no other name given under heaven by which a man may be saved. <coughs> Repent and be baptized, every one of you heathen, 
in the name of Jesus Christ, Jesus the King, and your sins will be forgiven. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And when Christ returns in glory to judge the living and the dead, he will raise you to live with him in his everlasting kingdom. Can you imagine anything more glorious, more amazing? Thank you.